Welcome, everybody, to today's Building My Legacy podcast. I have with me today Rick Maurer. Rick Maurer is involved in an area of business consulting that many companies are looking for today. You look at the change that we're seeing. We're seeing some of the research saying that companies have changed their strategy. 90%, 6% of the companies have said that they've shifted their strategy um, following the pandemic. That means change, a lot of change. The problem is, what do you do with change? And what do you do with the resistance that comes from change? Rick has written a book called Resistance, and it deals with resistance to change. He has dealt with some incredible companies in with his methodology. He's dealt with Lockheed Martin, Deloitte, National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, Verizon, Charles Schwab, the Washington Post, NASA, Tulane University, Verizon, uh, Kaiser Permanente, and the list goes on and on. So he has great wisdom, great experience. And Rick, how on earth did you get into change and change management and working with corporations in this way? (laughs) What a setup. Um, It's actually, I was in graduate school, I was going to work with emotionally disturbed kids in schools. And this graduate program was actually pretty radical. I didn't realize it at the time, but that suited me fine. And they said, you know, a lot of these kids aren't disturbed. It's the schools that are disturbed. Ah. And if you can, if you can, yeah, if you can change schools, if you can change systems, you'll have fewer kids acting up, acting crazy, all of that. I bought that then. I still do. But you can imagine here, my first real job out of school, I go in to an elementary school. That's where I'm assigned. And there are these teachers there who've got 30 years experience. And I go, hi, I'm here to help. And they'll go, well, that's swell, young man. You just sit right over there. And the moment we need help, we're going to call on you, by golly. You know, and I just realized I kept coming up with brilliant ideas. I mean, I got to tell you how bad it was. I worked in one of the lar- <laughs> one of the largest school systems in the United States. After two years experience, I saw how the system could improve elementary school education radically. Two years experience. Um, so I wrote a proposal. Nobody asked me to do it. I sent it to the superintendent and the superintendent of instruction met with me. And I'm sure it was just to keep a teacher off their back. And so he said, so tell me about this stuff. And I start going into this stuff. And I said, well, it's really based on the thinking of the eminent child psychologist, uh, Jean Piaget, who's in Switzerland. And I'm going on and on. And he said, Mr. Maurer, let me stop you. Those of us who work here in the school system have known about Dr. Piaget's work for quite some time. And then he could have followed it with, and don't let the door hit you on the way out. (laughs) And so for years, I thought, oh, these benighted souls, you know, here I'm brilliant and they don't get it. And then the more I looked at change and resistance, I thought, oh, I created my own problem. I had hardly any experience. So in a system like that, that counted for a lot. I didn't know anybody. Nobody could say, hey, the guy's new, but you really ought to pay attention to him. And I went in with the arrogance that youth brings you, you know, like I got a brilliant idea if you'll just shut up and listen. I mean, it was just, you know, and of course, I didn't think any of that was going on at all. I just thought it was, I had a great idea. And so I kept thinking about that stuff. I went back to school, studied organization development, and I was still interested in this thing with resistance because clients kept saying, you know, we're getting a lot of resistance to change. And the business press always used, not always, but I did a, a, a literature search uh, in the early 90s on resistance to change uh, in, bus- in business magazines. And one verb kept coming up over and over and over again, and that was overcome. We need to overcome resistance. Now, that sounds appealing. The problem is that when somebody tries to overcome, you know, you say, no, I don't really need that today. Well, yeah, but are you thinking about suddenly you're resisting even more? You know, and that's what happens in organizations. So I went back, kept studying. I studied at the Gestalt Institute of Cleveland. I liked their approach to respecting the resistance and respecting the people who are resisting because they're doing it for a good reason. And then how do you work with that? And so out of that foundation, I ended up building 
uh, or writing a book called Beyond the Wall of Resistance that came out in 96. And the phone started ringing. People started saying, could you help us? And that has become the foundation of my work. And it still is. I still try to build on and refine stuff that I was thinking about in the mid 90s. So Rick, what is the process that you take people through to help them get past resistance? Because we all have it. It's not just corporations. Each one of us as individuals have resistance to everything in our lives that involves change, mm -hmm. right? That's our initial go-to place. And then we may reason ourselves into something more rational. If it is rational, sometimes resistance is good. So tell me, what's the process that you take people through? Well, there's, um, there's a focal point that I use that's different. When, when I'm thinking about, gee, I ought to lose weight, gee, I ought to exercise more, that's, certainly I can have resistance there. The resistance I'm really interested in in organizations is the resistance that's happening kind of in the field between people. So it's not you're a resistor, but something is happening in the way this interaction is going on or in that culture. And I can give you a couple of examples of Please. that. Please. Okay. So I, when I first was starting, uh, one of the big consulting firms would, as they said, parachute me in to teach my stuff. And so they were working on a project, a very controversial project called business process reengineering with a client. And I was just there to teach my stuff. And I was working with their consultant and somebody in the group said they were all planners on this thing. And they said, Rick, next week, the bomb is going to drop. <laughs> well, the first, you know, first thing I so I'm trained to pick up on subtle cues like that. I but I but a key thing is that often it isn't kind of there in, you know, in neon lights, but it's there. People are saying there's a bomb that's going to drop or something. Things are really silent when they shouldn't be silent, all of that. And they said, what should we do? And I, I had no idea. I didn't even know what the problem was. And I, as I asked them, they said, look, we got this big meeting next Monday with all the stakeholders. We're rolling out the first draft of this plan. And oh, it's going to be awful. There's going to be blood everywhere. I mean, just horrible images. And then they look at me and say, what should we do? And I, I didn't know what to do, but I needed data. That's a key thing for, to, to really get at your question is we need information about why they might be resisting or supporting us. Without that, we're flying without radar. So what I did is I said, all right, everybody here knows somebody coming to that meeting. And, and I said, yeah. And I said, all right, what's going to be on their minds? And they started telling me, and I immediately knew what to do with what they told me. And I had just taught them these three levels of resistance, which I can tell you very quick, quickly. So level one was, I don't get it. People don't understand what's going on. And I said, let me use a green marker and underline those. Like people say, I don't understand this project. I don't understand when it's going to start, that kind of stuff. Level two is I don't like it. This is an emotional reaction based on fear. It's a very big one, by the way, for us as individuals, uh, you know, on things. At any rate, so I took a different color marker. I underlined the things that were based on uh, fear. And then the third one is I don't like you. So I don't get it. I don't like it. I don't like you. And I say, all right, so which of these have to do with their relationship with you? like they don't trust you or something. And I used a third color marker. So now this list is color coded. And this guy who'd said the bomb is going to drop said, oh, that's why it's going to drop. And people looked at him. So what are you talking about? He said, we designed that eight hour meeting to deal with level one issues, timelines, budgets, you know, all of that kind of stuff, which is essential. They said, but what we're, he said, what we're missing is 90% of what's on that list is level two. They're afraid of it. Like what's going to happen to my job, my career, my family. And third, they don't trust us. Okay. Just that insight of what's on that, what I call the list is essential. I mean, I won't work with a client until we know what's on the list. And here's what they did, which was absolutely brilliant. They could have turned to the consultant from the big firm, Ross, or they could have turned to me and said, so what should we do? Help us out. You know, and all, both Ross and I have, have all kinds of experience. We could have said, oh, we'll try this, try that. They didn't do that. They said, could we take the next hour and redesign that meeting? Oh. 
Yes. Good for them. And so they turned their chairs around. They didn't call on Ross or me during that hour. And they basically said, how do we cover the things we need to cover, but in a way that might actually make that emotional part, the level two, a little more favorable? And what, how can we run this meeting in a way that might actually start to build their trust in us? We can't do it all overnight, but how do we do that? And apparently that meeting went really well. They got a lot of people on their side. And so it, it, so the first thing for me is I've got to know what's on the list, which could be positive. People could be so excited and say, wow, Lois has come in with that great idea. That's wonderful. So then your strategies for moving ahead are very different than, oh, God, what did she dream up this time? Oh, she just did a podcast with that Rick Maurer guy. Oh, no, she's going to be doing, you know, that, that sort of thing. And, but we've got to know what that information is. And then, as, as with that, that company, they said, we know how to do, we'll come up with something. Or that's when they can say, you got any ideas? You know, so sorry, that's a long-winded answer, but that's kind of the basis of it. No, that's great, because I think those are the issues that people are really struggling with, and they want answers to. So once you walk people through that, you start the, the discussion, and you've identified those three things that create um, it's information, fear, not trusting you, right? Those right. two things. Then you have a process that you walk people through. Or is that your, the process? It's, no, it's a very good question. Sometimes, and by the way, sometimes the, the, if all I have to do is ask the people, and like in that instance, they say, oh, here's what's going on. Other times I might have to do, or they might have to do some focus groups. Uh, to do that. Um, I've actually done surveys and I was asking one client because they said, oh, no, 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 people trust us in that. We think people trust us. And I said, I don't like the word we think. We got to know. And I said, would you mind if I did a survey? And they said, oh, God, people are surveyed to death. They're going to hate it. And I said, how about a three question survey? It'll take less than five minutes. And I said, okay. So basically I said, hey, we got this big planning meeting. I'm excited to be working with you. Uh, this is anonymous uh, really would appreciate if you could give me, you know, some candid answers to these questions. And they were all the three levels, although I did not call them levels. I don't try to let, I don't want theory to get in the way of just people talking. And I said, all right, so your leader, I'll, I'll say her name was Betty, has been talking a lot about the need to change. What are your thoughts about that? That's level one, thoughts. And I'm not trying to say, do you resist it or support it? What are your thoughts? And it's open-ended. Level two is what are your reactions when you think that you might have to change like this? Once again, it could be positive, negative. And this is a place where I could hear a bomb is going to drop. I could hear metaphors that are really rich. And then third is, does Betty and her team have what, to what extent do Betty and her team have what it takes to lead something like this? Oh. Open-ended. And in that instance, that list was an incredibly powerful list and, and positive. Uh, and the only thing that was negative was corporate headquarters. They said, we, man, she's one of the best leaders we've ever had, but we're concerned about her bosses at corporate. They could come in and mess everything up. And so when I'm going over it with Betty and her team, they, she said, I know what to do with it. Uh, once again, they didn't need a technique from me. She said, if we can get, I can get somebody from corporate to come here and bless the meeting, basically kick it off in person, they'll be behind it. If they do it by sending a letter or an email, not so much. So sure enough, we have the planning meeting, somebody from corporate's there and he's in his suit and he goes, hey, we're really proud of what you folks are doing. And Betty, if you need anything from us, we're here. And they did, they got the support they needed. Wow. Um, so, so the big thing is you, you've got to know what's on the list. And then I, I want to find out, can the clients, sometimes that's all they need. You know, but if it's more than that, then I, I don't have a, a specified process, but what I like to do, like, well, uh, in, in this book that I just wrote, uh, Seizing Moments of Possibility, I would say, let's take, let's take that meeting you got coming next Monday. You know, the one you said is pretty deadly and people, oh, people are bored. It's awful. All right. What could you do to begin to tweak that meeting just a tiny bit? Don't do something big. Like if they're not used to something, you know, and I'll just give you, 
an example. Um, I have a client who's a scientist and he works with other noted scientists. And he said, you have to use PowerPoint. It seems like you're not prepared if you go in to a meeting without PowerPoint. And he said, it's ridiculous, but he said, it's true. And he called me one day and he said, you know, I agree with you, Rick, that PowerPoint is not good for influencing people, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and, and he said, and I had this presentation I, I wanted to make and because I needed the support of other scientists. And I had it probably about 50 slides. And I thought, what's the minimum I could use? And it was five. He said, so five was like, oh, he's done his homework. But he said, what happened is I was able to cover all the same material, but because I wasn't beholden to the slides, there was more conversation and people actually got engaged. So once again, he came up with the idea. It was kind of seeing what was there and then being curious, what else could he do? I mean, and now I'll tell that story to clients. So I really am looking for simple ways that are already kind of in their quiver in their bag of tricks that they could go, oh, I could do that. I could do a question and answer. I could do that sort of thing. Let so me I, ask you, with yeah. a client that was basically a positive experience, I mean, she was ready, her organization was ready for change. What kind of response rate do you anticipate to a survey, positive or negative situation? The results I'm guessing would be different. <laughs> yeah, I, and sadly, I don't get a lot of positive ones. Um, and it's, so that story that I just told you happened a number of years ago. I mean, I've had other organizations, you know, that are doing well, but it was so dramatic. Um, I think the response rate was 70%. Wow. Which was, wow. yeah. Wow. wow. Amazing. It is amazing. And I, it really, it, it it's pretty low. The fact is awfully low if if that level three people don't trust the leaders because people are wondering, is this really anonymous? Are they really going to use it? I've told them a million times before uh, that kind of thing. And so you can get that. But even if I we can get a, a little stuff from that, uh, it can be helpful. Or I, I will say, hey, let me do some focus groups or you folks have the resources. Why don't you go out and just do a few focus groups? Buy people a cup of coffee. Just, just have a conversation and see what you come up with to get, because it's really, if the survey isn't working, I wouldn't throw it away. I'd say, all right, let's find it. Let's find a way that might be more comfortable for them and for you. Um, and because getting the information is absolutely essential. Right, right. So, oh, can I say one other thing? Of course. Well, one thing that amazes me is I can go into an organization where people do not trust management. And I don't know why this is, but I can be out talking to the people on the floor and I could go, so what's it like here? And people go, oh, yeah, well, let me tell you, Rick. And they'll give me all this stuff. And I, I'm amazed. I mean, I definitely don't say, hey, you can trust me. I'm not a crook. I mean, that's you can't do that. But something happens. People want to talk so much that if you just, I think if you just seem credible, that like, yeah, they can really trust you with that stuff um, is goes a long way. So I'm not suggesting you have to have a consultant to do that, but but maybe there's somebody on your team that people already trust that that would be really good at gathering that kind of information. You know, isn't that the truth? And I mean, people, I think, are so afraid of the shoe dropping on them. And, you know, we see that with people being let go on a whim, it seems sometimes. And so there's that fear. There's always that fear. But the, what's fascinating is people want to talk about what's not working because they want it better. So they do. Yeah, they do. Um, I, I remember I was working in a health healthcare system and I knew they were about to go into strategic planning. And I realized the executives did not have a clue what was going on at level one, two, and three. I mean, basically they didn't know the people. And so I said, I, did, I said two things. I said, one, I'd like to do some focus groups. Just can you set them up for me? And they said, yeah. And I said, I'd like each of you I said to the CEO, I said, I'm going to ask you and your, your executives to each conduct a focus group. And I said, your team is going to be furious 
like, why are you listening to this consultant? I said, here's a time when I would like you to say, we hired him. That's what we're going to do. And, and, and they did. They, he, he said, well, I'm really busy, Rick. That's why we hire you. And I said, no, no, I'm going to do it too. But, and what amazed me, it's two things, is when I went out, I, I, just, I, I, it was just a group of maybe 1,700 people, so not huge. And I said, if the CEO walked in, would you recognize him? People go, is he that guy with, no, no, I don't, I don't think so. And I said, how about the chief finance officer? No. How about the chief technology officer? No. And I said, well, how about the head of nursing? And they said, oh, yeah, everybody knows Peggy. And I, and I said, why? And they said, well, she comes out on the floor. And he said, not only that, other directors of nursing, often if they have to have a staff meeting and try to get as many people there, they'll say, we're going to hold it at three in the afternoon. So if you're on the midnight to 8 a.m. shift, that's pretty uncomfortable. And he said, Peggy didn't do that. She says, hey, I'm going, I've got an important meeting. I'm going to hold it at three in the afternoon, but I'll hold it the next day at 3 a.m. So come to the one that's most convenient. I mean, just that, I know, I know when you get up in the middle of the night, that's not a little thing, but that little thing had a huge impact on people. She's also had the ability to listen to people and really be influenced. I mean, people knew this woman was good and she cared about them and it made a difference. And the people that I, the executives I asked to go out and to do this, the crustiest of them, the chief operations officer who really didn't like all this touchy feely stuff was the biggest advocate for what she learned during these conversations. And she'd say, wait, wait a minute, folks. I heard something in the focus group, blah, blah, blah. And she kept doing that. And it was, I, I was stunned. And had I come in and say, hey, here are the seven things I learned, that would have been, yeah, that's what that consultant learned. You probably got it on PowerPoint too, don't you, buddy? I mean, it just, you know, but the fact that she said it was just made a huge difference in their process. So now tell me, did you have to coach the executives on how to ask questions so that they could actually run a focus group effectively? You know, I don't think I did. It might have been a good idea. I think I, what I did is I set it up and said, all right, look, it's going to be a, a mixed group that, that you do. And here are the questions I'd like you to ask. And I probably, I don't remember the, exactly what I said, but I probably said, and your, your goal there is not to give answers. You're, you're, the, you're there just like a reporter. You're just trying to learn stuff and to say, hey, I just need to learn this. And I'm going to be taking it back. We're going to use it in the focus groups. And I said, the more that you do that, the better off it'll be. But I didn't, I didn't give any training. I mean, training would be a good thing, but I, I don't think I had that. I don't know why I didn't do it, frankly. I can't remember. So Rick, so many organizations now are going through change. And how do they know when they need help? Well, my, okay, my, the entire focus of my work is on the people part. And it's two questions. Why do people support us and why do they resist us? Okay. So what I would look at is I would, I would look at the, the last change that you did like this, or basically change big changes that, that need the support of other people and say, how did they go? Um, and I, in, in the new book, which is by the way, is free. So it's not sounding like I'm, I'm you know, and, and you get a picture of me too. Um, it's, it's none of that. <laughs> it's yeah, for free. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> I lost where I was going with that. You uh, oh, yeah. In, in the final chapter of the book, I talk about these pockets of energy. And so this is something that your uh, listeners right now could do. They don't need some special tool. I think any big project or change has these pockets of energy that it can either work for you or against you. And so I'll tell people what those are, and I will tell, tell people what they are in just a second. And then I say, all right, so chart the flow of energy in a, a past change. Okay. So the first part is where people feel a sense of urgency. Now you can get at that urgency uh, in a lot of different ways, but the key is the emotional term is that do, do we feel that sense of urgency? Do the stakeholders feel it? The second stage would be the planning stage. And the energy I'm looking for there is anticipation. Are people kind of geared up, exciting? So a friend of mine said she left a big planning meeting like that. And she said, Rick, 
it was so exciting. It's like my feet weren't hitting the floor. So you're looking for that. Is it there? Is it not? Are people asleep at the wheel or not? The third one is the planning ends and you move on in, into implementation. And often that's where changes go to die. The planners get really excited about planning and then they hand it off into the ether and hope something happens. And the word I look for, and I really had, it took a long time to think about what's the energy word for implementation. And for me, it's mastery. Mm -hmm. If you think of a good athlete or a good musician, um, I'm a part-time musician. And when I'm around the people who are really good, like at a higher pay grade than me, I mean, when they practice, they practice, they just don't run through stuff. And when you watch a good golfer or baseball player or soccer player, their practice is very serious. I mean, they don't let things go by and hope that next time maybe it'll be better. They really work on it. And so at that implementation, that detail level, there's that sense of the pride in getting close, as close as we can to mastery. So the notion of Six Sigma, all of that. Some projects end now after the implementation, which is not very good because the problem, all we're doing there in this measuring, did we do it on time and in budget? Did we get the right software? The key is that next pocket of energy, and that is actually getting value from all that. And what you, and oddly enough, some organizations just take that for granted. And it's sad, but so the energy you're looking for there is resolve. That we have a resolve to actually turn all that work into something valuable. So I would say to listeners, and I say it to myself, is all right, so let's take a look at a, a past project that either went really well or really poorly. And let's track the energy. Where did it go high? Where did it go low? And I'll just give a couple of examples. One is I call the big bang approach to change. And that is during the planning stage, they bring in a lot of people. I mean, sometimes hundreds of people. And people are at, at tables work, working with people they've never worked with before. They're arguing about things. They're coming up with ideas. There's an incredible amount of excitement there. So you can see the energy just spiking. And then nothing happens for a week or a month or two months. And the energy just plummets. And so by the time the leaders come back and say, okay, we're ready for a follow-up, people don't even remember what happened. Okay, That's a very common one. Another common one is imagine that the energy never gets very high. It just sort of goes along kind of in a horizontal line, almost like a dotted line. And I call that a change on life support. So there's a <laughs> Okay. There's, a, there's enough energy there so that people will go to the meetings, they'll fill in the forms, but they'll, they'll be treating everything like they're a C student. What do I need to do? Because I was a C student in high school. Um, what, it, what do I do to get out of this class so I don't have to take it again? That was my, that was my standard of excellence. And you know, if, you, if you're working on, if you got a bunch of Rick Mowers do, working just so that they can get out of the meeting on to the next thing, you're going to come up with some pretty mediocre plans. So what I do is I say to people, all right, so, so come up with a map that you develop and you using these pockets of energy and saying, all right, so here's, here's, here's what I really love about it. I was working with a client right before the pandemic and there was this place where the energy really started to plummet on this. And, and I said, why, why do you think it plummeted? Oh, here's why. Ba, 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 ba. And I said, anything you could have done? Oh yeah. And right there, they got the answer. So they've identified what went wrong or, wow, there was this incredible spike upward. Well, why did that happen? Oh, could you replicate that? Yeah. So I'm really trying to draw on what they already know and what they've experienced. But I want them to say, if that energy line is just you know, a big bang kind of thing or they're just on life support or, it, or whatever, that, that uh, that's where they ought to be curious. But if they're doing it really well consistently, yeah, that maybe in spirit of continuous improvement, they might want to take a look at the kind of stuff I've developed, but it's not essential. Got it. Oh. You know, I think, Rick, the other thing that I've learned is once you've done with execution, people feel really good. They did it. They did it. And they see the results. It's to keep that energy so that they're ready for more, 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 because one change isn't it. You know, with life and organization, it's going to be a constant. 
Yeah. And so it's keeping that readiness always <clears throat> on alert. That's a challenge. It's a challenge. And I think, actually, I think you just addressed it perfectly. Um, in when status quo was more than norm uh, in organizations and changes were these special kind of things that had to happen, um, you could say, okay, we got to ramp up for this big change. And today we don't have that luxury because there are multiple changes going on, lots of stuff. And that first stage, that urgency, often we leave people out of the loop. So when we've got a change, we then have to make a case that this is really important to do. Organizations that treat that first pocket, that urgency pocket seriously, give people information all the time. So they're not trying to lay down breadcrumbs to lead them somewhere. They're saying, this is what's going on. Here's how we're doing compared to our competitors. Here's what customers are saying about us. You know, here's what our financial performance is. I'm trusting people with information. And I know one CEO said, he said, we started doing that. And it was really simple. I mean, it was a one page quarterly report. I mean, it was nothing fancy. He said, people started coming to me, the CEO saying, hey, we're concerned that our customer service scores are going down. We got worried about that. We looked into it. We think we know why, and we have a suggestion. So not only were these people not resisting change, they were coming to the CEO saying, we got an idea. And, and the only way that can happen is if people are in the loop. And that doesn't mean ramping up for this particular change, but they're in the loop all the time. So if you can say, hey, so-and-so, how's your company doing? I mean, obviously there are things that you wouldn't say outside the company, but there are things that they, they know what's going on. They, you know, they're worried just like the executives are worried. They're excited just like the executives are excited. Does that make sense? It makes wonderful sense, Rick. And our time is almost up. What have we missed? What do we need to talk about that we haven't talked about? The, we, we touched on this, and it really, it's, it's really important to me that if, if, if people listening to this say, okay, I get that we need to have support, but who has time for that? You know, we're so busy, which is absolutely legitimate. What I've been doing in recent years, and that's why the, the Seizing Moments of Possibility, uh, when I wrote it, is I think we need to start and finding ways to blend support into the routine tasks. So for imagine you got this meeting coming up next Tuesday and you go, oh, no, everybody there is going to be asleep at the wheel. It's going to be awful. Say, is there some small thing that we could do that might have an impact? And you're basic doing it for two reasons. Starting small is not going to threaten the group like, uh oh, she read another book. Uh, but it's also not going to threaten you because if it doesn't go well, you still can step back and learn from it. And so the, the whole book is about how do, how do you start there and just start tweaking? The guy who used to run um, Scandinavian Air. A uh, named, guy named Jan Carlson took them out of bankruptcy. I mean, they were in serious trouble. And he said, remember him. ah, good. And he wrote a book and I can't remember the exact title, but it was something like million, millions of moments of truth or thousands of moments of truth. And his argument was that every day we come into contact with people who use our airline. And often a lot of them are stressed. They've lost something and that. Every one of those is an opportunity, sometimes just within seconds, to do something rather than handing it off and saying, oh, you got to go to that, that kiosk down the hall. Oh, I'm sorry, but you missed your flight. That there are things that we can do. And it's that kind of spirit of looking at the dreariest meeting and saying, how can I add some life to that? What can I do? To me, that's, that's a really big thing. And by the way, that's, and then there are these uh, application activities in the book so that people could actually be doing that while they're engaged in something. So. so seizing moments of possibility. I love it because the world is all about looking for potential and possibilities. So it's free on you as an ebook on your website. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, we will put a connection in the show notes so that you can um, link and get a copy of that book. And certainly um, Rick's other book, which is Beyond the Wall of Resistance. It is available at Amazon. You will enjoy that book as well. 
Rick, thank you so much for being with us today and oh. on Building My Legacy podcast. Those of you who are listening to us today, thank you for being with us. And remember to visit our website at buildtomorrow.com. Rick, thanks. You're welcome. It was a pleasure. Thank you for watching my video. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and click the bell button above. Leave comments. We'd love to hear what you think. And visit our other social media links as well. Thanks much.